Good afternoon, and welcome to the CIS Speaker Series. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ashley Hurst. Ashley's here from London, uh, where he's a partner at the law firm of Oswang LLP. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oswang. Oswang, yeah. yes. Uh, he specializes in litigating media and internet-related disputes, represents uh, broadcasters, content providers, website operators, and uh, internet intermediaries on a range of claims, specifically defamation actions and privacy injunctions. Ashley is an expert in social media, and he regularly advises um, internet intermediaries on their social media policies and liability issues arising from social media. So he is particularly well qualified to lead today's discussion on intermediary liability in Europe and to explain how the risks and regulations that companies face in Europe for privacy, defamation, copyright, how those claims are different than under US law. Um, so, and we're also excited to hear his ideas for a possible solution to ensure that internet intermediaries are taken out of the liability equation wherever possible. So, and we will, of course, have a Q&A discussion following Ashley's presentation. So, please welcome Ashley Hurst. Thanks very much, Julian. Thank you uh, to all of you, really, for, for, for attending, and thank you to Jennifer for inviting me to come and speak at this prestigious law school. Uh, as, as Julie mentioned, I'm a commercial litigator and I focus mainly on media and internet disputes. And never before have those two areas, those two sectors of media and technology been so closely intertwined. So we're seeing the traditional media companies, the broadcasters, newspapers, looking to new models to generate revenues from online content the newspaper's case to replace dwindling sales of hard copy newspapers. And at the same time, we're seeing companies like Google and Yahoo become news providers and content of uh, high quality video. And so they're now competing in the market uh, for uh, media content. And all of this is giving rise to a whole lot of inter interesting uh, legal issues. And unfortunately, while most of the laws of copyright defamation were kind of uh, drafted with the traditional media in mind. And so the laws, uh, particularly in Europe, and I think also in the US, are, are gradually trying to keep up with the constant uh, development in, in this space. And that's leading to uh, some conflicts and uh, some inconsistencies. Uh, and you know, one of the big issues is the, the extent to which internet intermediaries, and there are a whole range of them, from search engines to website operators to blogging hosts, to ISPs, access providers, uh, what role they should play, uh, if any, in preventing the publication of unlawful content. And so I, I've called the subject of today's talk intermediary liability in Europe to block or not to block. And I use the term intermediary liability to, or liability to really encapsulate two areas. One is the liability for damages for failing to remove unlawful content uh, once on notice of it. And secondly, the liability for failing to comply with court orders requiring steps to be taken to prevent further publication of unlawful content. And in particular, I have in mind there the, the use of blocking injunctions, which is particularly controversial in Europe, and I know also uh, over here. Uh, so current trends in Europe, we're currently seeing this, this big increase in the, in the use of uh, blocking injunctions. So far, mainly restricted to copyright, and also mainly restricted to being against internet access providers uh, and there to block domains, URLs, and IP addresses. Um, but we wait to see whether those blocking injunctions are going to start creeping into uh, other laws, in particular uh, privacy. The defamation, uh, we are seeing increasingly an, uh, website operators being the subject of takedown requests of a defamatory material. And a lot of these companies have their have their bases and their servers in the US. And of course, in the US, you have the First Amendment, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and now the Speech Act, which means that uh, any uh, European judgments which are inconsistent with US laws uh, can't be enforced in the UK. And so we're having different laws being developed in Europe uh, than, than, than in the US. Uh, and so the UK government, in particular, are looking at this at the moment and deciding whether some additional defenses are needed for website operators. That's distinct from internet access providers who currently have immunity, similar to Section 230. 
but whether the website operators such as the Googles and the Facebooks who are a little bit close to the content, whether they can come up with some kind of procedure whereby they can step out of the dispute. And we can come back to that. And in relation to privacy, this has been a hugely controversial area. You know, first, we had the rise and fall of the super injunction in the UK, uh, injunctions that were to stop us finding out what footballers in the UK got up to on a Saturday night. Uh, and these injunctions, whilst effective to begin with, were actually rendered worthless in the end by the publication of this material on the internet, mainly by uh, rogue internet users. But we've seen more recently uh, the Kate Middleton example of where, despite which was clearly private information, French news uh, magazine Closer decided to hell with it, we're going to publish anyway. Uh, and you know, we wait to see whether anybody in France will, will be successfully criminally prosecuted uh, for that editorial decision. All the newspapers in the UK spent a lot of column inches on it, but they have all refused to uh, publish the pictures, which I'm sure are still widely available on the internet. So I wanted to raise a few questions for debate, which I hope we can come back to at the end. Um, first of all, what is the role of internet intermediaries in preventing the publication of unlawful material on the internet? Is it right that they face any liability at all for third party content? And does potential liability stifle innovation and freedom of speech? Secondly, how far should these blocking injunctions go? You know, when do they become disproportionate? Should they be able to be used to block a particular video or a particular web page? Thirdly, should there be any protection for anonymous speech? And this is a particular point of debate in relation to the defamation bill in the UK. Uh, do, do people who refuse to step forward and, uh, and be identified to litigation, do they have any equal rights to people who are happy to be identified and be subject to legal proceedings? And then finally, very much a hypothetical question, somewhat of an unrealistic one, I think. Is a transatlantic gnosis and takedown regime realistic? So to try and put these issues into sharp focus, I've come up with this hypothetical scenario, and it is hypothetical. Uh, you might recognize a few of the facts from a few recent cases that you might have heard about. So Prince Herbert is the playboy prince next in line to the throne, and he's on holiday with friends in Las Vegas. One of his friends borrows his iPhone, and videos a game of strip poker in his hotel room. And Herbert is filmed stripping off with a mystery girl. And the iPhone then mysteriously goes missing. A few days later, the, the uh, video appears on YouTube uh, and with a caption which is embedded into the video saying, Herbert plays away with poker girl. So immediately we've got copyright issues in the video. We've got private information uh, and now we've got a defamatory allegation that Herbert is being unfaithful to his girlfriend back in the UK. And so Herbert sends a takedown request off to Google or YouTube, and they decide to take it down, um, probably on copyright grounds. But it then reappears up 10 minutes later, and then it's all over the internet. It's popping up on blogs, other video sharing websites. And this is all now starting to get viral, and it's, it's going higher and higher in the Google rankings. And then, just to make matters worse, a French magazine decides to publish stills of the video on the first five pages of its magazine, citing that the public have the right to know about uh, what Herbert is up to in Las Vegas. So Herbert then has a conversation with Google, and they tell him that we ca they can't reveal the identity of the person that posted this material, but that it was uploaded in the UK. So the, uh, the person responsible for all this is situated, uh, we think, in the UK, but of course, he's anonymous. So, copyright, defamation, and privacy issues in play. Taking, first of all, copyright issues, the primary infringement liability is quite straightforward. I mean, th there could potentially be a debate about who is the copyright owner in the video, given the fact it, it wasn't Herbert who took the video, but that's unlikely to wash. So, Herbert's going to be the copyright owner. Uh, he's clearly not consented to the publication of this video uh, on, on anywhere, including on websites. And therefore, there's clearly going to be primary infringement. And that would be you know, a, a sufficient basis for a takedown request. But what about secondary liability of uh, Google once it's put on notice? 
Um, and like the DMCA regime in the US, we in Europe have uh, a defense for a, a hosting provider if they act expeditiously, if they act quickly on notice of the unlawful material. So it must be unlawful. It's no good simply asserting copyright over a picture or a video. You must be able to demonstrate, at least on a, a prima facie basis, that you're the copyright owner, that Herbert is the copyright owner in this video. That being the case, that it must act quickly to take it down if it's to avoid potential liability for secondary infringement. But if it keeps going back up, then we're going through this rigmarole of constant notices in respect to multiple videos, then Herbert might consider whether he, he wants to seek a blocking injunction. And the ability to obtain a blocking injunction in Europe stems from two directives. First of all, it, the Information Society Directive, Article 8.3, uh, and a very similar provision in the Enforcement Directive 2004. The, the Information Society Directive applies to copyright or related rights. Uh, the enforcement directive applies more broadly to uncover um, trademark rights. And we wait to see whether they actually, they, they, that, those provisions or other more general provisions um, of discretion of the courts will extend that ability to obtain blocking injunctions uh, to private information. Uh, so those provisions have been used quite successfully in a couple of recent cases. The best examples. Um, I, I cited here are the Newsbin case, 20th Century Fox and BT. Uh, that concerned f pirate film content. Um, and secondly, Dramatico Entertainment uh, and B Sky B and others, the, the Pirate Bay case, which concerned peer to peer music file sharing. And in both of those cases, there was a big debate, first of all, about whether it was primary infringement, whether sharing of peer to uh, facilitating peer to peer uh, file sharing was a primary infringement. Both cases established that it was, and therefore the question turned to whether it was necessary and proportionate to grant a blocking injunction against the, the access providers who could actually block certain IP addresses or domains. So in both cases now, they've been granted. So the, the content owners are winning the battle in Europe at the moment, and they've got a head of steam, and we wait to see whether they're going to start targeting um, uh, you know, other website operators, not just the access providers, but for example, you know, the Googles and Facebooks of, of this world. And I think we'll see not just the film, the film content owners, the big music companies, uh, uh, but also broadcasters, and potentially even other owners of content, even potentially corporate owners. So what is going to become absolutely key in all of this area is whether these injunctions are proportionate and whether they're necessary. And the key wording is taken from the case of L'Oreal and eBay, which is a, a trademark case. And the court in that case said that the, the enforcement directive can be used to prevent both existing infringement and future infringement, but that absolutely crucially, they must be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. So if there simply isn't any point in getting these injunctions, then the court isn't going to grant them. And that was a big point of the debate in the, uh, the news bin cases when the pirates always find a way around these injunctions. Uh, the court felt in, the, in that case that there was still a lot that could be done, uh, both from a technical point of view, but also in, in sending out a message to pirates in the market that you know, action can be taken by uh, the content owners. So uh, this is Richard Dwyer. I don't know how many of you whether any of you have been following this story uh, about uh, Richard Dwyer, but he was a student at Sheffield Hallam University in Yorkshire. And then he uh, set up from his student room a website um, which provided links to pirate TV material on third party websites. And the US con content owners have been working with US authorities and managed to persuade the Home Secretary in the UK to order the extradition of Mr. O'Dwyer uh, to face criminal prosecution in the US. And this, you might imagine, has caused a huge storm in the UK, uh, and is currently subject to review, and I'm not going to enter into the debate about whether it's right that he comes over to face the wrath of uh, the US criminal courts, uh, but the Secretary, the Secretary of State has recently grant, uh, said that Gary McKinnon, who, who was a, another student who hacked into a US website, uh, can, can stay in the UK and not face uh, US criminal prosecution. So. 
I suspect that the 250,000 people that have signed the petition for him to stay will probably get their way, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. So that's the copyright position. So uh, at the moment, it's perhaps not looking too great for Herbert because he's got to persuade the court that uh, any blocking injunction in respect of all these videos flying around the internet are going to be necessary, proportionate, and dissuasive. I think he's got a pretty, pretty, he's in a different position to those more sophisticated peer-to-peer -peer file sharing websites where huge sums of money are at stake. Uh, but we haven't yet got a judgment which really tests that theory out. For defamation, this, is, this really marks a distinction between where we are in Europe and where you are in the US. And it might horrify you to think that this material might be taken down by Google on defamation grounds because you've got the First Amendment, and you've got Section 230, and now the Speech Act. Uh, and in a, we're in a situation where most people in the UK are kind of accepting that if they're faced with a US-based company, then there's very little they can do uh, at the moment, even if they can go to court and get a judgment on liability grounds, because they know they're never going to get the costs back, and they're actually not going to enforce the judgment. Query whether if a US company breaches a court order in the UK, it could be hauled in front of the UK court for, con uh, for contempt of court. Similar to the example of you know, Google's um, vice president in Brazil who was recently arrested for breaching a court order. So we wait to see. That make, might make a few companies a little, a little nervous. But we don't have a Section 230 equivalent. The closest we have is that access providers, internet access providers, are immune. So they, they pro just providing the access to the internet, they're not close enough to the content say the courts, to have the necessary mental element to do something to stop the further publication. But that doesn't apply to the website operators um, who have the ability just to re surgically remove a particular video or a particular sentence or, or a bit of content. So hosting companies are potentially liable. I'll come back. There's some gray area there, but they are potentially liable. Uh, but query at the moment whether any judgments can be enforced against them due to the Speech Act. So there's a line of authority in the, in the UK in particular which has developed in this area. And the first one, we go back to 1937, which was a case in a golf club, a case of Bernard Dean, uh, where there was a notice board in a golf club and that somebody, one of the members had posted a defamatory statement up there and the secretary of the golf club was notified of this and didn't do anything about it, refused to take it down and he was successfully sued for the damage as a result. And that kind of analogy has been applied in the case of Godfrey and Demon Internet, which was the first case which really focused on these issues uh, back in 1999. And Demon was simply providing hosting services. It received notification of a defamatory statement on one of its discussion forums. They took, I think it was 12 days to take it down, and they were successfully sued for the damage caused in that 12 days. Uh, so the position since 1999 has generally been in, in, in the UK, and this has been replicated throughout Europe, but upon notice of a complaint about defamation, provided it reaches a certain standard, uh, then the approach of certainly hosting companies has been to take it down, but also website operators who potentially face liability have been taking it down. And, and this has led to a big debate, well, why should all this material be coming down just on the basis of a flimsy notice? And this is where you know, absolutely the debate is with the government are addressing, can we get to the stage where more material stays upon the internet and it's not just simply taken down by intermediaries who would like the material to be up there because they support freedom of expression, but it's really not um, for them to be getting involved in this dispute and they certainly don't want to face liability for very costly defamation actions. Now there's a recent, two more recent cases which have shifted the balance slightly back in favor of the internet intermediaries. The first, metropolitan schools against Google. And this is a case which concerned Google search, and it decided that in respect of its search engine, Google was not liable for the defamatory snippets which come up on search results. So the court said that was an automatic process, and they didn't have the necessary mental element to be liable as a publisher. So in effect, they're in the same position as the internet access providers a mere conduit. But perhaps even more controversially is the recent case of Tummies and Google. Now that said that Google, as the owner of blogger.com, 
a blogging hosting service was not liable for defamatory blog. Now, it received a complaint about a, a blog on its platform. It took a little over three weeks, I think, to notify the author. The author then take, took it down, and the subject of the, uh, the blog then sued Google for the damage in that uh, three-week period. Uh, there's lots of complicated arguments running in that case, but absolutely crucially, the, the judge decided that Google, in that situation, was a mere conduit. It did not have the necessary mental element to become a publisher at common law, which meant that you didn't even get into debate about whether it had a defense because it acted expeditiously or not. It did cover those issues. It said that three, three and a little bit weeks was expeditious enough, which is also controversial. Um, but absolutely crucially, it said that it didn't even consider those issues because it wasn't a publisher. Now that's going to appeal in December and is going to be a really, really crucial decision as to where this goes in the next couple of years. So that's the liability side. Could, you get an, could Herbert get an injunction against one of the intermediaries um, or even a John Doe order um, against you know, the, the person who posted this material uh, based on defamation grounds? And there's an old principle in, certainly in English law, and I think, again, this is replicated th throughout Europe, it's very difficult to get a, an injunction on defamation grounds. Uh, if the defendant comes to court or says in a letter that they're going to defend their, their actions and their, and their statement, uh, the, the court says that damages in those cases would be an adequate remedy. So you can fight it out of the court, and if you, if you get it wrong, you can pay damages, and that will uh, restore uh, the reputation. The exception to that, and we're, we're seeing this increasingly with, with, with more internet content, is where there's an anonymous user who doesn't come to court and says, I'm going to prove it to be true. Or in a case where you've got the, sort of, you know, the crazy person who puts all these allegations upon the internet uh, and turns up to court and says he's going to prove it all to be true. And we, we had one of these cases uh, well, a few years ago now where a group of individuals in Sunderland, there's a town in the north, uh, east of England, had set up a, an anonymous website, and they were accusing the executives of this company of doing all sorts of things, from having sex in cupboards to giving each other backhanders to their contractors on golf clubs. Outrageous allegations, none of which were true. We sought an injunction, and we identified through a disclosure order who was responsible for this content, and this guy pitched up to court, and the judge said, you know, how can you possibly pr prove the truth of all these allegations? So I've got the evidence and I can prove it all to be true. And the judge said, well, what evidence have you got? And he says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the evidence. And he said, well, that's just not good enough. And he granted the injunction. And, and since then, we're seeing increasingly the courts more willing to grant an injunctions in defamation actions. Again, query whether these kind of proceedings are going to be enforceable in, if they have to be, attempt to be enforced in the US. Well, I would say, actually, there's a difference in, in enforcing a damages award in the US under the Speech Act compared to whether there can be liability for breaching a UK court order. The concern there is not whether you're going to be ordered to pay damages, but whether perhaps one of you know, US executives is going to be arrested at Heathrow when he arrives in the UK for breaching a court order. So you mentioned at the start the, the action that the UK government are, are, are taking to try and address this balance where the intermediaries just take everything down in response to a complaint. Uh, and so there'll be a new defense uh, for website operators. This is not the access providers. They don't need it. Um, so there'll be a new defense for website operators, which will be anybody who just runs a blog, or it could be a whole platform such as, as Google or Facebook, if they attempt to put the complainant in touch with the author. Now, the, the big point of debate, and, and the point I want to come back to at the end, I'd love to get your comments on, is, is what should be the default position where the website operator passes the complaint onto the poster, and the poster either A, doesn't respond, or B, comes back and says, I'm standing by my posting, it's true. Don't take it down, and don't identify me to uh, the, the complainant. Now, in those circumstances, the debate is, well, if the material stays up, the claimant doesn't have a remedy. They'll have to go to court and get a disclosure order. That's going to be very expensive. Might have an injunction. That might not be possible because of the the previous precedent. So is there a way and is there a procedure whereby we can improve the ability of claimants to have a remedy in those cases but take the intermediaries out of the decision-making process? 
So moving on to privacy. Uh, I don't know how many of you followed the Prince Harry story. Um, but again, you know, there's a huge debate in the UK about whether UK media could publish these pictures. It's clearly private information. Uh, and you know, all the newspapers in the UK decided, whether for political re reasons or actually to follow the law, they decided not to publish. And the Sun very cleverly decided, well, we're going to try and get around this. And they, and they got one of their journalists to pose, which is the left-hand uh, front page. Uh, because, of course, they had the photos and they did a mock-up. Um, so everybody knew what the kind of thing to expect was. And, and then the next day, they, they said, to hell with it, we're going to publish these pictures. And they did so on the... Yeah. That's right, yeah. So on the left, Harry grabs the crown jewels. It's not actually Harry, Harry grabbing the crown jewels. Um, and this actually is uh, Harry on, on the right-hand side. And they published it on the public interest grounds that this information was so widely available on the internet that it would be a travesty if its readers weren't able to get into the discussion and see the photos that everyone was talking about. Um, nobody else ran that argument. Um, but so far, Prince Harry decided not to relive this ordeal by suing in the courts, and they've got away with it. And, and also, the, the regulator, the Press Complaints Commission in the UK, is not looking at it either at the moment, because Harry himself has not made a complaint, and, and who could blame him? Uh, w one person that would have particular sympathy with Harry is Max Mosley there. And again, this was a hugely controversial story. It was published on the front page of the News of the World before it got closed down, um, and it accused Max Mosley, who was the president of the Formula One uh, Association, of being involved in some sick Nats, Nazi orgy. Uh, and Max Mosley was getting up to uh, various activities in some dungeon, and they'd sent in one of these girls with a, with a video surreptitiously, and she'd recorded it. And they published this video up on the website and published this front page together with a big four and five spread um, in great detail with my, pictures of him doing all sorts of things and did so on the public interest grounds that he had been saying publicly that we need to stamp out racism in motorsport. So it was only right that the public hear that this guy was a Nazi sympathizer. Well, he sued and he eventually, he sued it for breach of privacy. And he, and, he, and he said there's no public interest grounds because the Nazi element was not there. There was no Nazi element to this, and the court accepted that. And he's since also sued for defamation for the damage to his reputation in France uh, and in the UK. But the reason I, I focus on this example in the internet context is because very shortly after the video was published on the News of the World's website, Max Mosey went off to court and said to the judge, you know, I want an injunction to get this taken down. And by that stage, the video had migrated onto various other video sharing websites across the internet. And the judge said, no, an in injunction would be pointless. Um, so I'm not going to grant it. And I think that's widely understood now to be probably a wrong decision. Had he got the injunction, he would have been able to serve it on all the major websites. Uh, and they would no doubt have complied with it and taken it down. It wouldn't have stopped the video coming up. I'm sure if you did a quick Google search now, you'll find it if, you, if you're interested. Um, but at least it would have reduced some of the damage. And for private material, the courts tend to view the fact that there's a fresh intrusion every time it's downloaded or every time it's published on a website or in a magazine. And Max Mosley went in over 80 different countries to try and seek remedies and take down orders to get this video taken down. So where does that leave Herbert? So he, he's struggling a little bit in copyright because he's not sure whether this and blocking injunction is going to be proportionate. He's going to struggle on defamation grounds uh, unless he can show that this person is anonymous and it would be proportionate to get an injunction. But what, what, what is that really going to have any impact at all on the many videos that are reappearing all over the internet? And on privacy grounds, still undeveloped as to whether he can obtain a blocking injunction on privacy grounds. So what he might want to do is go after, well, first of all, he needs to get a good PR advisor. But the next thing is that he might want to consider getting a disclosure order against the person who uh, uploaded the video onto YouTube. 
And that, of course, has its whole, whole range of privacy issues in itself. So, you know, what procedure, what, what is the standard we need to get to before Google should hand over the details of their user who uploaded this material? They're not going to come to court and, and argue why they shouldn't be identified. And this, particular, and this is a kind of bad example in this respect, but they're, they're, it's put into stark contrast when there's a whistleblower of a company who's, who's revealing perhaps confidential information or private information with a real public interest element. The fact that a company is engaging in illicit practices. Now, is it right that the courts will order the disclosure of those identities? And again, this is an issue in the defamation bill arguments as to, well, if it's acceptable for material to be uh, left upon the internet, then surely the claimant ought to be able to get disclosure of the, uh, the poster's comments in order to be able to bring proceedings against them. But there is going to be that, um, that threshold across that you must show that the material is prima facie unlawful. I picked out this cartoon, and these things have been you know, in, in heavy use since about 2014. If you can't read that, it has been large and is finally found after record industry lawyers trace him illegally downloading music files. Um, but they, they, these kind of orders now are commonplace in the UK, but they typically cost about five or 10,000 pounds, which is a lot of money for a man in the street to have to spend uh, in respect of uh, some very serious allegations about him. So he was a solicitor who didn't have a, a, a practicing license, and that was causing the loss of his practice. So he's struggling, Herbert, and, and just to make matters worse, uh, He's now thinking, what can I do in France? And in France, actually, they notoriously have got very strict privacy laws. And of all the places uh, where you'd expect them to, to comply with them, uh, you'd expect France to, but not so, it seems. And the main reason is that they don't have the same kind of penalty. They have criminal sanctions, but they don't have the same civil remedies in terms of damages, in particular, the, the ability to award exemplary damages as potentially uh, might be arguable in the UK. And so there's no commercial disincentive for Closer Magazine uh, in the Kate Middleton case not to publish. And so the accusation that's been made against them was, well, they just did a calculation. They're going to make more in terms of sales and profile than they will if they get found liable for breach of privacy. So this is a, this is a problem because particularly advising UK, US companies over here is that we have these laws which are supposedly harmonized uh, through, the human, through the European Convention on Human Rights, through the e-commerce directive, um, and through the ver various copyright directives. But each member state in Europe is applying them slightly differently. And not only the government's applying laws differently in the courts are, but companies are taking different commercial approaches to. So where are we going to, to head to in the future? Well, to, to come back to the defamation bill again, I think, you know, I think the, the UK government are absolutely right to identify that it's, it's not right that in the US you have the position underpinned by the First Amendment that material can stay up there. Even if essentially unlawful, the material stays up there. The, 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 the European uh, governments are never going to get to that stage. We're never going to get to having a, a, a point blank Section 230. And so they're looking at ways to at least improve the position to get a little bit closer to that, not go all the way. They have to have some role to play, but how can they make it so that the author and the complainant get in touch with each other a little bit more often? Um, and it comes back to this big debate about what to do about anonymous content. And what we're, we're thinking about, one possible option that's open to debate is whether we can create a more streamlined notice and takedown procedure, something similar to DMCA. Where you, where you fill in an online form, it goes to some judge, it's all very straightforward, it's low cost, and he takes an initial decision as to whether the material should come down or not, only on a very temporary basis uh, until the parties can resolve the dispute. Absent that, I suspect that some of the House of Lords uh, members who themselves have been the victims of stings in newspapers and online content may say, well, this is just a little bit too unfair on the claimants if they're forced to get expensive disclosure orders or try to get injunctions on this basis. The European Commission are taking a look at the moment as to whether um, a notice and takedown procedure can be developed which covers copyright, trademarks, defamation, something a little bit more unified. Um, 
So we wait to see whether that's going to be possible. It, it, it's always going to be difficult to try and harmonize laws across many different member states. But where I think we, we certainly won't have is a transatlantic protocol, because your First Amendment and Section 230 are just so far embedded into US law that it's very difficult to see how we can be totally unified. So where does that leave poor Herbert? And he's not ginger hair, so it is all hypothetical. Um, I think he's in a difficult position. I think that my you know, closing advice to him will probably to perhaps think about not spending quite so much on lawyers, uh, to get a better security guard, to not leave his iPhone lying around, and probably to buy his girlfriend a big bunch of flowers from when he gets home. So that was all I was going to say at the moment. And I, I leave back those questions which I, I raised earlier to see if anybody wants to comment on those issues or ask any questions in relation to the matters raised. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm going to exercise a, uh, a sort of host privilege and ask some questions that I have about this and have a little discussion. And then we'll open it up for questions from everybody else who's here, if that's OK. So my first question is, let's sort of switch hats a little bit and put on, instead of representing the uh, prints, let's, let's talk about counseling the intermediary, so YouTube or Google in this case. And in the absence of these proposed safe harbors, just what, what is the liability that the providers and the intermediaries currently are looking at um, in the UK or the EU? Are we worried about damages? Are we worried about litigation costs? Is it just an injunction? Like, what's the... What's the downside here? Yeah. Um, well, the reality actually at the moment is that the position is not so bad for intermediaries. You know, there are defenses, so it's not quite as good as Section 230. But those e-commerce directives, Article 14 of the e-commerce directive for hosting providers is a good defense. Because the claimant needs to show, first of all, that the material is unlawful. And that doesn't mean just saying it's defamatory, that it lowers the reputation. It means having consideration of the defenses. And that has actually, in effect, re reverses the burden of proof in normal defamation cases. And that's a considerable defense for them to receive a notice and say, look, you haven't made out your case sufficiently. You need to explain what's untrue. Um, you know, why is it that this is an honest opinion, for example? And so that can be the first line of defense. Then it has a defense if it uh, takes action reasonably quickly. And we saw in the Google Tamiz case, it took three weeks to contact the author. And the, the judge said, well, that, that was just about OK. Now, we'll wait to see whether that upholds, but they've at least got a period of time to take this material down if they want to. Um, if they don't, then the numbers of cases against these intermediaries are fairly few and far between. And Google have been fairly unlucky so far. But the, these cases are not in the courts every week. There are a lot of takedown notices, but there are not many UK or internet intermediaries being ordered to pay damages because they didn't act quickly enough. So the position is not too bad. This is about improving from an already pretty good Position. Yeah, so, so, so the default there where you're not looking at serious liability as the company would be default leave it up because we're not looking at any real liability. What about in copyright? You said it gives you an additional defense to potential copyright liability. And what I read into that is that there's uncertainty in EU law, just like there's uncertainty in United States law, about the scope of liability for the intermediaries in the absence even of any safe harbor. So is that true, yeah. too, with copyright? It's just not clear? I think there is. And, and there's so much debate uh, um, in relation to patent material about primary infringement. But, you know, where it has to be primary infringement, of course, to be secondary infringement. And a lot of the debate is, well, if you provide links, for example, to third-party websites, as in the Richard O'Dwyer case, well, is that a case where you can then impose secondary liability to be able to get a blocking injunction or even threaten liability? Uh, actually, there are, again, there are very, very few cases where the internet intermediaries are facing liability actions for failing to remove it. And we may see more injunctions, but very few cases where the intermediaries are being sued for secondary liability. Yeah. So there are some, some cloudy legal issues, but practically, it's, a lot of these issues is not so much about liability, it's about the practical difficulties. You know, to get all these takedown requests, I mean, think about how many takedown requests Facebook or Google would get on a daily basis. They have to get people who are responding to these complaints, and they need procedures to be able to follow it. They don't want uncertainty. And if they get dragged into a legal proceedings, that's additional costs. And it's, they have to instruct lawyers. 
you know, and their big, their big issue is, you know, they want something which is workable. They don't want to have to devise complex technology to block material. You know, they're happy to get involved, but as long as it's proportionate, it's not going to divert huge resources away from innovating and producing, you know, new ways of, you know, of distributing content. So, so let me get to my second question here, because I think in order to answer the question you have up there, which is, does potential liability stifle innovation and free speech, we first have to, I think, understand what the, um, what the companies are likely to do given the current state of liability, and then say, well, how does a safe harbor proposal change what the company's default activity would be in terms of taking down the user? taking down the user content. So for me here, I asked you to play the role of the person who's interested in advising the intermediary. But for me here, as the civil libertarian, I'm just trying to predict what's going to result in more valid speech staying up, right? So let, let's talk then about the, about the safe harbor provisions and about um, the unification of the idea that you know we're going to treat copyright, trademark, defamation, privacy, um, similarly and have a kind of unified or similar notice and take down. Now, clearly from the company side, right, that makes some sense because you only have to do it one way. But, but think about it from the speech side. Like, do you, there's real differences in, um, you know, the difference between clearly unlawful conduct, content, let's say, like child pornography versus something that's copyright infringing where you have fair use or exceptions and limitations versus defamation. And I'm not exactly clear on what's defamatory under UK law because yeah. the fact that the prince was cheating on his girlfriend, that's not defamatory, right? That's actually true in the hypothetical. So in the US, it wouldn't be defamatory. No, because there was no proof that he was actually doing anything he was cheating. It was just playing a game of strip poker. <laughs> uh, so he would say it was not true that he was cheating. Uh, I job. think in the US, we would probably say that's not defamatory. It's a little bit of a uh, matter of opinion whether strip poker's cheating or not. We're not going to have a vote on that. It's for after. But, uh, but so, so t can you comment a little bit on what, what you think? If you have a safe harbor that requires, I mean, what's, what can these things be unified? And is the unification like just put the copyright owner in, content, in contact with the poster, just put the two parties in the defamation in contact? Or what's, where's the yeah. takedown come I mean, in there? And should it be different. treated the same? Yeah. The copyright's different because you know, everybody recognizes copyright. And you've got the DMCA procedures. And that's all about, can you establish that you're the copyright owner? If you can, then it's fairly straightforward. Okay, there are questions about whether infringement and copying is taking place, which can get complicated. But they're very different from the issues raised in a def defamation action. I mean, you raised, you know, a good example of in this case. Is it defamatory? Well, you know, it's not really for the intermediaries to have to get uh, advice on. Well, is this defamatory in UK law? What about French law? What about Spanish law? You know, and if it's defamatory, then is it true? We don't know that because we weren't there in the room. So do we need to go off chasing the people who were in that room in the, in the Las Vegas hotel? You know, or, or if he made other comments, is it honest opinion? I mean, the intermediaries are simply not in a position to make these decisions. And a good example is perhaps TripAdvisor. You know, so imagine you get a hotel review comes in uh, and says that uh, my wallet was sto stolen in my room at this hotel. Uh, you know, I don't know who did it, but you know, I would never stay at this hotel again. You know, and the hotel owner makes a complaint and says, well, that is defamatory of the hotel because it, it's implying that we don't make sure that we vet our staff or that, you know, we don't check that our cleaners aren't stealing wallets. Well, and, and, and then TripAdvisor gets this complaint in, and let's say that it goes back to the, um, the author of the review, and the review says, look, I, you know, here it is. Here's my insurance claim the following day. So supervisor go back to the complainant and they say, well, no, we've got records saying this person didn't actually stay there. And, and they don't want to be in a position of having to decide what, what's true or what's not. And, that, and that, that tend, that's, a difficult, that's a difference between defamation cases and copyright actions. It, actually, most cases in copyright seem to be quite straightforward and there's a quick decision. It's more difficult, I would say, for actions of defamation where there's much more nebulous concepts for the intermediaries to have to decide. And of course, the courts are in no real better position at an early stage in the proceedings to decide what's true or not. But at least they can say at the outset, well, OK, you've at least met the prima facie requirements of a defamation action. You know, it's defamatory. You've considered the defense it's not immediately honest comment or not, there's no evidence that it's true. So I don't, I don't think we can get to a unified position where you adopt the same procedures for copyright and defamation. I just think the two are, are two different. The, the, the daily complaints are just very different issues. I, I have a question about that. Um, given that uncertainty that you have identified that for the intermediaries, but what is it in the law, under, in UK law, that protects 
the intermediaries from that kind of that potential liability. So if they're if they're just following an, a notice and takedown procedure and everybody is just like that's the general practice, that's that seems okay. But if there is still potential liability, it seems to me that that would um, interfere with your ability to advise, say, a new company and say who who wants to set up a platform and you're saying. Well, there's potential liability, but it's not, you, you know, is your advice really, it's just not going to happen? Or is there some, is there more security in the law? Because that's where it seems like the innovation needs, they need m something more than, well, you could get sued, but it's unlikely to really happen. That's just not what we see. I, yeah. Well, I mean, the current position, before we go into Section 5, the current position is that the complaint comes in and it looks like a good complaint. You know, this is some seriously defamatory material here. If you establish that actually this guy's got a good case, then in order to have a defense, the intermediate defense, you'd need to take it down quickly. Unless you want to rely on the other defenses of truth, honest comment, qualified privileges. What the new defense will do, or it aims to do, is that if you follow a procedure, you'll have an additional defense. So the complaint comes in, you could say, right, well, we're not going to take it down straight away. We'll keep it up there. But provided we follow this procedure, which involves contacting the author and then passing that response back on to the complainant and then doing that within a particular time period and following any court orders, provided they follow that procedure, they'll have a defense. Now, I guess the difficulty will, be, will come is if these are on a, for the Googles and Facebooks, if they're having hundreds of these complaints, do they want to be following this complicated procedure in every case? Or will they take the position, well, you know, why don't we just go back to the old position and just take stuff down? So, I mean, this is absolutely at the heart of the debate. These procedures have to be clear so that the companies will actually use them. You know, there's an awful lot of time being spent debating this issue. And if they don't get it right, the result could be that we don't move things much further on. Do the proposals include uh, counter notice or causes of action for abuse of the takedown procedure on the part of the copyright owners or the allegedly defamed people? So the, the way that we are suggesting getting out of that is to make sure that there's a statement of truth that goes attached to the, to the notice of complaint. So that if it turns out that they misled the court in that notice, or mis that they could potentially be liable for contempt of court. Um, that, I think, is probably as far as it will, it will go. Mm -hmm. for that so my, my last question, and then we'll turn it over to the audience, is the question about the takedowns and the, and the future takedowns, which seems to me to be a very technically and sort of procedurally complicated thing to say we're going to keep it down you know, for the foreseeable future. And so my question is, how can companies do these future takedowns in compliance with the injunctions, and, and how can you really do any kind of proactive or preventative keeping things down, like a takedown, stay down, um, and still be in compliance with um, Article 15 of the e-commerce directive, which says that you can't generally require monitoring. Um, and, and so it seems like if you're going to keep things down, you have to do some amount of content surveillance and user surveillance as well. So doesn't, doesn't that practically have the effect of running headlong into privacy protections yeah. that, are, that are enshrined in the directive? I, I don't think we're going to get to the stage where the courts will order a proactive step to be taken to prevent future, i.e. some kind of monitoring requirement. It, it may impose technical measures to block specific URLs or specific IP addresses as detailed in a list. It won't say right from now on you need to have people monitoring your service to make sure there are no future actions. And, and you talked about Article 15. In the defamation bill, we're looking at in, having an equivalent section which says, you know, merely by the fact of having a moderation policy, an intermediary library will not be treated as being a primary publisher. So this is, this is a really important point for the internet, internet companies. They, they want to have some kind of moderation. They want to be able to get rid of profanity and have certain search filters. They may even have a mechanism whereby it flags up certain content because, for example, and it might be child porn or something, that they want to be able to, to prevent. So they don't want to just leave their services open to the masses. But by doing that, that moderation and doing so responsibly, they don't want to find themselves in the role of primary publisher. So, yeah. I, I suggest the uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act would resolve that problem for providers in the EU. So with that, um, why don't we open it up. Does anybody else have any questions or any comments, thoughts on any of these issues? Hi, 
Hi, thank you. Uh, I worry about uh, how large is the proposal, the scope of the proposal uh, that the Commission is studying, because uh, it's obvious that the European Union has competence uh, on, cop on copyright issues, on data protection issues, but it doesn't have any competence on things like civil law, what we would call civil law, so that what it's defamation in Spain or in Italy, it, it may not be defamation in the UK. So I really worry about these proposals in the sense that I'm not sure about the legitimacy of the European Union to do that. Uh, um, that can, can you comment yeah, a little I, on this? I, I think it's kind of aware of, uh, of those issues. At this stage, it's just sent out a questionnaire when you're able to say, you know, it's very exploratory at this stage. How are these procedures working in different member states? Uh, and I know Italy are considering slightly, uh, do things slightly differently than, for example, Spain and France and the UK. And it's just trying to get, gather some intelligence as to what's working and what's not. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, these issues actually are not just about copyright, privacy and defamation. A lot of them are about harassment now. The, you know, a lot of the stuff I get is complaints about harassment on, on Facebook or any you know, other internet material. So, and, and harassment laws are very different across different member states. So, and this is why I think it's, they're going to struggle to make it workable. But I, I do welcome some consideration across member states as to, as to getting some kind of procedure in place, at least talk to each other, and so that at least the US companies can think, OK, we don't have to get 25 pieces of different advice from member states. You know, they could, they could, for example, come to us in London and say, Just give us the European uh, view. Uh, but we're, we're quite a way off that at the moment, and I, I share your concerns as well. Um, just, just for the American uh, audience, I think it's uh, very important what you, was just said about defamation, and, and I think you have to divide between whether it's speech harassment or it's copyright. I think on the copyright, we got the international uh, convention that most of uh, countries have signed, so that is more or less the, the same pattern. Uh, but when we got to talk about speech and uh, defamation and uh, damages, it's very different between U.S., U.K., and uh, at least the uh, uh, civil law countries uh, on the continent. Um, I mean, uh, it's quite well known that if you on the continent have wants to have make a defamation case and get big damages, we will go to London. So that is the big difference between UK and uh, the rest of Europe. I mean, I would love somebody to uh, sort of talk about the justification for Section 230 and whether you think, from an American standpoint, that that strikes the right balance. That actually, you just accept as a consequence of Section 230 that some claimants are not going to have a remedy and this material will be up on the internet for years to come. I mean, does anybody take a contrary re review to the, uh, um, view of Section 230? Anyone in this room? Yeah. Or in the well, anybody in this room. I certainly, certainly they do in the debate. I know there's been a huge <laughs> amount of controversy about the extent of Section 230. I mean, the other issue is the related issue is what should the default position be, given the fact that we don't have a Section 230? What should the default position be if the author comes back to the complaint and says, look, I'm standing by my restaurant review or my hotel review? And presumably, you would all say, well, yes, the material should, should stay up there, and that should be the default position. But if that's the case, then is it right that the claimant has to spend, I don't know, 
10, 15, 20,000 pounds in order to, to get a remedy because he can't get the internet company to take it down. And that, 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 you know, that's, that's where the big debate is in the UK. a notice, it's a valid notice, not even does it, is it actually, you know, you, they don't have to prove anything or the truth, it's just complies with the NCA requirements of a notice of takedown. Yet that, the intermediate, you know, they take it down for a period of time, they give, you know, the counter notice opportunity, and if it goes back up, then it's between those two yeah. parties, you know, when it's between those two parties, and the intermediary but, but that, that's copyright, though, isn't it? I mean, that, no, that's really, copyright's about money, really, isn't it? It's about exploitation of your creative works. You know, whatever, whatever it's, it's all about your reputation or your, your privacy. You know, Max Mosley got this video of him doing things that he's really going to regret, with what he already regrets, in a few years' time. Or let's say Harry was, um, was filmed naked, and he's going to have to have that going around all the Google searches for years and years to come. Or somebody accuses me as, as a lawyer in the UK of, uh, being corrupt, you know, and as a result, I lose half of my practice, and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, so my whole livelihood and reputation is at stake. Does that mean that actually it's different from copyright? I pose the questions. But... Well, I mean, it, it, obviously, you know, your, your point is that yeah, the monetary damages, you know, the, you know, the idea that then the person who started this defamatory statement would then just owe you so much more in damage because of... But he's got, he's got no money. He's got no money. He's, he's in the Seychelles. He's, you know, he's... He, um, so, the, you know, this, this is the case. What do you do when you can't have anybody to see? Because you can't sue intermediaries, and you can't sue the anonymous user. Or you, you, you found out who the user is, but, you know, he's a student at Sheffield Hallam University. He's not going to pay your costs or, or give you any compensation. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's where the debate is, but it, it's... It's always been of interest to me that you've got this sort of position in the U.S. where you kind of just say, "Well, that's just a that's just a consequence of the First Amendment," that's, and, and it's it's a it's a bold position. It's uh, and yet our newspapers are so much tamer than yours. <laughs> I know it's just a place. the First Amendment. The real, uh, Actually, I I think you're gonna you're, you're probably gonna see less of this um, in future. I'm sure you've all heard about the Leveson inquiry, um, but ever since the sort of phone hacking scandal uh, at the News of the World, there's been a real focus, and I mean, the press have been battered to death by the Leveson inquiry, um, and we'll probably see a slightly more, a, a regulator come out of it with a little more teeth to, to stop this kind of thing, but you've always got newspapers willing to take a bit of a risk because, of course, by taking risks, they get reputation, and by reputation, they sell, sell more, more newspapers, and it's all great fun. Remedy for bad speech is more speech. And if you're not corrupt, then you put up testimonial from your customers. If you are, you know, if, if you're naked, then you, you know, do something good, like beat a bunch of poor people, and then maybe that will be the top story on Google instead of how you were in sleazebag and data. Mm. So that's the principle behind the first amendment. And we, I, I, we have comfort level with that. That's so different even from other Western democracies. Pretty deeply embedded in our jurisprudence, yeah. and I think, I mean, you guys, but I think that Americans buy into that. Like that's not something that the laws decide, and we go along. With, like I think we all, I think that it's a it's a very um, it's a, it's a moral thing that mm. people kind of really hold dear. They, we enter the first time yeah. it's everybody's favorite amendment. Is what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you let the reader decide, right? You put two competing arguments up there and let the reader decide. Um, but and, and you know they, they toyed with the idea in the UK of having a requirement that you know if the, if the if the content stays up after a complaint, whether there should be a notice that goes up on the website saying this review or this article or blog posting is subject to a legal complaint, and I think the general thinking well that probably didn't really go, you know, far enough in most cases to. You wouldn't be able to do that here. To yeah. <laughs> Whether the fact that someone's an anonymous speaker justifies treating their speech differently. I'm curious what you think and what other people think. Yeah. Um, I think there are examples, there are whistleblower examples where 
Um, the anonymous user clearly has an interest in speaking out. But I'm yet to see many examples of where it perhaps wasn't more appropriate to take their complaint to the police, to their company, to a regulator, some more restrictive body than just publicizing it on the internet. You know, and we have defenses in UK law of privilege where there's a duty, a moral interest, if you like, to publish something and an interest in the receiving body and receive that information. But that doesn't extend to just blithely putting everything out on the internet. And I think you know, the proportionate thing in those cases is for the anonymous person to be identified, but perhaps to be cloaked in anonymity for, as far as the outside world is concerned. So uh, there ought to be orders which restrict the claimant and the anonymous person to have their dispute about the merits of the case behind closed doors in a court without the press reporting it. Um, but I, I, I suspect you're not going to get, you're not going to persuade the UK courts that. Um, there's a, some general right of anonymous speech, which means that they shouldn't make disclosure orders when the anonymous user is making serious defamatory uh, allegations. I don't know whether anybody takes a different view. Someone must take a different view. Uh, what about bogus uh, copyright claims? Uh, th there are two aspects of this that I know of. One is that if Google knows that something is copyrighted, they will try and automatically take down stuff that might be conflicting. And the other is that uh, publishing companies will go searching the web for stuff that they think is their copyright and then send in. And both sides of that are buggy. And there's no sensible appeal mechanism in there. It's just all automatic. And if you, you, know, you go to Google and ask for help in sorting something like this out, they won't hear you. Yeah. And, and there's the kind of distinction between the legal position and the practical reality is that you know, in the UK, uh, an intermediary would have a defense. They would be able to refuse a takedown if the copyright owner can't provide some kind of proof that they are the copyright owner. Um, because that, then the material, would, they wouldn't be on notice that material was unlawful. Um, but the reality, of course, is that the intermediaries don't want to be getting into a big debate uh, in each and every complaint, and they get lots of them, as to who, who the prominence of the copyright owner. It might be a very complicated question. Often the simplest thing is just to, to, to take the stuff down and, and, and wait to see if the... Um, you know, the person who posted the, comp the complaint raises the complaint, and in many cases they won't because you know, life will have moved on. So it, it's a muddy area, but we can't get to the stage where companies who have got so many users and so many complaints are going through this detailed procedure to, to establish exactly who the copyright owner and what the chain of copyright ownership is. Um, but there should, be, there, should be some, there should be some penalty for, in, in my view, for false assertions and to deliberate, knowingly false assertions. And of course, everybody can get confused as to whether they're the copyright owner or not. Um, you, you might think you're the copyright owner of a photograph when in fact it belongs to the photographer. Um, but where you deliberately try to sue, suppress material based on false complaints of copyright, then I think there ought to be some kind of deterrent against that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, the the stuff I was talking about was was not deliberate. It was you know some piece of software someplace that's run amok. And, and the, the the mechanism is all there. It's just that it doesn't work right. Sorry, I'm not sure I'm follow the question.
Yeah, well, I don't know whether necessarily is a distinction between having software that sends these things automatically uh, and, you know, a human putting uh, pen to paper. I mean, if you're setting up, to, you know, automatic procedures to be able to do it, then, uh, again, provided you're not doing so dishonestly, I don't think there should, ought to be penalties. But if you are doing, if you're not having proper consideration as to whether you're the copyright owner, there ought to be some uh, deterrent against that. But I keep coming back to it. The intermediaries don't want to be the arbiters of these complex issues. And there are an enormous number of complex issues about primary copyright infringement on the internet, whether providing links is copyright um, infringing, or whether you, if you intercept a feed and you're only providing, sharing on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you're not communicating to the public, is that primary infringement? These are all being debated, and it's not for the intermediaries to get their armies of lawyers, or, or very few lawyers in a lot of cases, um, to have to determine these issues. Okay, well, it sounds like we are uh, out of time here, but we want to thank you, Ashley, for coming, and thanks all of you for participating.